Firstly, I want to extend my greetings to everybody at the conference. I regret that I can't be there in person, uh, but I'm also content with the opportunity to be able to share at least some of my remarks uh, and my recommendations concerning uh, the therapeutic community and the work that you're doing there. The, the title of this talk, which will not be a long talk, is The Therapeutic Community Going Forward, which means it really reflects my thinking based upon a variety of experiences, both clinical and research, about where this remarkable approach, the therapeutic community, has been, how it's evolved, and where it's going in the future. And I'm going to use two words which will maybe capture how I feel about making a talk like this. I'm both concerned and I'm optimistic. And uh, I hope you will have an appreciation for that after I simply review what I would call the evolutionary arc of the therapeutic community and and we're going to do it in a relatively brief period of time, so this is not going to be a heavy-handed lecture. So you have some slides that you'll be able to see as I talk. And uh, on this first key point, it has to do with describing this evolution. And you need to know something at the outset, which is this approach, the original therapeutic community approach, was developed by the first participants themselves. It did not come out of mental health. It did not come out of medicine. It did not come out of sociology or academia or the university. It came out from people who were suffering and troubled in life, came together, and on a day-by-day -day basis, trial and error, learned how to work with each other, ultimately in community, learning how to help each other change. That was the origin of the approach. To the extent that that original approach has been maintained, namely communities of individuals who are trying to work with each other to help each other change, to the extent that they still exist, and I hope many of them exist in Asia, they're, they're, they're rapidly disappearing in North America and elsewhere, but to the extent that there is real community uh, in terms of the participants who are invested in the change process and use each other and everything they're doing in that process to change, that ultimately assures that this approach can continue and flourish. So when we talk about evolution, we're really talking about a quick look at over some 50, 60 years since the original therapeutic communities were launched by the participants themselves. What can we say has happened? Well, I have some key accomplishments. I'm just gonna keep it as brief as possible. The diffusion of the TC worldwide, I'm talking about worldwide now, which may be viewed as a movement Really, over the years, the first 20 to 30 years of the therapeutic community was really a movement because there was a rapid acceleration of programs. But it was a movement from the marginal, that is, programs which were founded by recovering people themselves who were trying to change their lives, out on the margins of society, a movement from there into the mainstream of society. And that's where therapeutic communities committed themselves. They wanted to go into the mainstream. They didn't want to stay in the margins. And that is they wanted to go into public health and get uh, receive funding by public health and also be obligated to the requirements of public health, which were training and research and so on. The early therapeutic communities over the first 30, 40 years were committed to that. They wanted to go that direction. So what did they accomplish from moving from the marginal way out on the extreme into mainstream? Well, I'm trying to summarize four points on that. One, there was considerable research which documented the fact of recovery. Prior to therapeutic communities, there was the belief that individuals who had serious bona fide substance abuse problems did not recover. 
And that is that, and I was captured in a very, very dark phrase, once a junkie, always a junkie. That was the thought. That was, even the, even the clients themselves believed that. Um, not only the medical society and the mental health society, but therapeutic communities were one of the first approaches which captured a lot of data, doing research, I was part of that process, doing research, which documented the fact of recovery, that actually if you followed people who had been in therapeutic communities over some number of years, you would see actually significant re numbers of people recovering. They not only stopped their drug use, but transformed their lives. And, and the, the research basis, which was essentially conducted a lot by programs themselves and then finally by external universities who were following what the programs were doing, they established that these programs can be, they're not always, not every one of them, but many of the, uh, the ones that we would call high fidelity, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, showing that programs that were essentially demonstrated high fidelity therapeutic communities doing what they're supposed to do were very effective. And not only that, they were cost effective. They saved the society money, cost benefits, and so on. So that was one, one accomplishment that it provided a research base for statements about recovery and, and cost benefits. There was a second benefit, and that is from the original population of substance abusers, opiate addicts mainly originally, and then finally uh, abusers of all kinds of other drugs, and then finally into wide numbers of other populations, of like, for example, those who had other kinds of either personality disorder or mental illness, uh, all the application of the therapeutic key community with some modifications was shown to be workable. You can, you can bring this model to a number of different populations, provided you actually retain the core approach. Community is method, I'll talk about that soon. But once you can retain that, then you can modify for various populations and setting up actually special programs for dealing with, you know, people who had substance abuse problems and mental illness, adolescents, people in shelters and so on, homeless, uh, and even uh, those who were on psychopharmacological treatments like methadone, all of which had uh, theses touched a number of those populations with modified models of the therapeutic community. And they also were evaluated and shown to be effective uh, uh, in turn, as long as they retained the basic uh, uh, approach of the therapeutic community, which is community as method, we'll talk about that again, but we're still talking about what's the accomplishment. So the application of the approach over all these years has been widespread. There's a third very important development, which is close to my own heart on this, and, and I, I hope others who followed my own work can appreciate this. So over some 40 or 50 years, one major accomplishment of the, of the TC is the emergence of a TC theory and method. Remember I said earlier is that the whole approach started with the participants coming together to live together on a daily basis to learn how to help each other change their lives. They didn't have any particular theory about that. They didn't draw on any particular psychological approach or sociological approach. They simply worked on a 24 seven hour basis, 24, 24 seven, helping each other in various role relationships and activities, helping each other, see each other, change each other. They didn't have a theory. The only theory they had, which if we wanted to use that word, is what we would call a native theory, which is from what they knew about themselves, what they, how they talked to each other and living on the street, and how they talked about each other in terms of how they need to change. So there was native theory, but there was nothing like anything, a formal understanding of how and why people change in the therapeutic community. But over the years, the clinical experience and the research experience has demonstrated that we actually have now a, a workable theory about how how people change in the therapeutic community, and and it's it's that theory and those changes which are really the most uh, uh, important contribution of the therapeutic community approach. Because now, once you have a theory, you can really teach, you can really train, you can really do research, you can carry out a whole number of activities to make that better. Once you know what you're doing, how do you make it better? And so one of the profound accomplishments over these years has been the emergence of TC theory and uh, a theory of, and method. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that before we stop today. And then the funny, the fourth point, and here's one that very few people acknowledge, 
but I've been around long enough to tell you this, and that is a major accomplishment in this, all these years has been the development of cadres of recovered counselors and coaches who contributed to the, the, the wide drug treatment field in general and the recovery movement in particular. In other words, prior to therapeutic communities, we did not have a labor force that was a recovered labor force because there was not much recovery. What we find finally as years of graduates and long-term dropouts began to show positive effects from therapeutic communities, they were also the same people who were beginning to establish the first labor force to really treat uh, substance abuse treatment. So the first 30 years of TC graduates and long-term dropouts, people who had, made, had, had successful recoveries in TCs, they mainly populated the labor force in, in the drug treatment field. Not to their advantage, that's a whole sociological and political discussion about, you know, what in some ways how they basically didn't, didn't benefit as much as they should have benefited from that in terms of what, what they needed to know and how they should continue to advance as professionals. But I'm making the point in terms of a key accomplishment now, and that accomplishment was it established the drug treatment field in terms of counselors and coaches and, and later on, of course, as, as public health began to really absorb the, uh, the drug problem, they had to reach back into getting labor from traditional uh, areas like social work and psychology and psychiatry. But that labor force was never particularly effective with, with, with substance abuse treatment or those clients, you know what I mean? Remember, this talk started with the fact that the therapeutic community really started not by professionals, but by individuals who were in the recovery process themselves. And they ultimately made a long-term contribution to establishing the evolution of a labor, a drug treatment, sophisticated drug treatment labor force. So those are just four key points that summarize really the accomplishment. Now, as, as good as that sounds, I wanna now talk about uh, this next slide, which is, the, still part of the evolution of the TC, but we're really talking about now, not accomplishments, but kinds of issues that also have, can be documented over this 50, 60 year period of the therapeutic community. And it's, I'm trying to keep it simple because we don't have a lot of time and it's not a heavy handed lecture, but it's just a, a way of making you aware of what I think everybody who's interested in this field should know. One is once we were in the mainstream and depending on of course tax money and public health money, Funding issues were very, very influential in what happened to the TC, and namely, uh, particularly around the issues of planned duration of treatment. Those great accomplishments that we just talked about were mainly documented on people in the therapeutic community who essentially could assert, be in that process for at least a year and a half or two years in a, in a program. We used to say 24 months is the optimal time to be in, invested in that broken up over various stages like primary treatment and ultimately re-entry, but at, at least a two-year involvement in the change process to get those long-term recoveries. So once you got funding into the picture that essentially had certain views and obligations about what, how much funding was available, we all know the problem of what happened to planned duration of treatment, and namely, it all got shorter and shorter. And so one of the major issues that has affected the therapeutic community in its evolution has been this gradual change in planned duration of treatment, shorter and shorter. If it's shorter and shorter, you can't get longer and longer recoveries. You know, when it's shorter and shorter, you're going to, you may get some other kinds of changes, but you're not going to see the long-term recoveries in that. So that was one critical issue. Uh, and we'll come back to it when we talk about what's going forward. How do we handle that? The second point was uh, one that I'll just speak with you briefly about a second great issue, which is, the, the, the need for more and more research and new research. TCs, as much as they reported on people who were in treatment, left treatment, and, and, and were followed maybe 12 years later, five to 12 years later, they couldn't really construct studies which had kind of the classical medical requirement of, let's say, randomized, double-blind, controlled trials. So it's, that research, while it's always been regarded, has not been highly respected. It was accepted as, as, as information that TC seemed to work, 
But there's always been a skepticism around that because we couldn't carry out very complicated randomized controlled trials that you can carry out, let's say, in psychopharmacology to show how something works. So it's always been a pressure in the field to get better and better at the research that we do to increase the, the certainty and the confidence about the conclusions that we're making. So that's another issue that going forward is we're going to talk about in a moment uh, what that research agenda has to look like. And then finally, as much as um, uh, I mentioned earlier about the contribution of the early workforce, as therapeutic communities expanded into all these different populations and all uh, different populations got involved in substance abuse problems, bringing in a, la a labor force that, that required, um, because if you're dealing with mental health or you're dealing with adolescence or you're dealing with trauma uh, and other kinds of issues or, or homelessness, all those issues did require other kinds of labor force expertise that, we, that TCs originally didn't have. They weren't even interested in that. So the issue was, while we got an in, a broader labor force involved in the TC, both original recovering people as well as non-recovered people, that fundamentally and paradoxically weakened the approach in terms of community as method because most of that non-recovered labor force did not understand community as method. They hadn't been through that process, and it was even hard for them to fully respect it uh, because you know they came out of traditional uh, educational values, which is you know you go you go to you go to social work school or you go to medical school and so on, and they had uh, their own particular vernacular and their own goals. So while that's gotten better over time because those people had to be trained, uh, it weakened the therapeutic community. The more you diffuse the labor force around understanding community as method, which is both an experiential and a didactic change process. The, the more it was difficult uh, for uh, non-recovered professionals to understand uh, and appreciate what was going on in the community. So we lacked fundamentally an experienced TC experienced workforce. And this is the, another critical issue over the years which has essentially affected the TC. We had less and less highly trained TC people which meant not only their rec own recovery in the TCs, but they went on to have other uh, life experience, educational experience, which essentially blended with their own recovery and made them distinctive contributors to the field. It was always the view in TCs that you were only going to be here for a short time. It's going to be two years. It's supposed to prepare you for life to move on. And when you move on, you have the benefits of your own recovery experience, but you've got to keep moving on. You've got to keep getting education. You've got to keep getting skillful. You have to keep getting more knowledge. That was the original value system in TC. It still is, but we don't have that many graduates. We don't, we don't see it in the way we once saw it. So that whole issue of the experienced workforce, workforce needs more discussion, but I hope you, you get the point. And then finally, all of these factors really resulted or contributed to this last factor on the slide that you're looking at. That's the erosion of the, of the word you see there's fidelity. Fidelity of the TC treatment approach. And I gave, I gave that a name years and years ago in, in, one of the, in one of the book publications. And fidelity really means the approach is really community as method. And what I'm getting at here is this is an issue. What I'm, why I'm saying it is because even in, in, our, in the field of therapeutic communities, they're not all familiar even with the phrase community as method. And when they finally hear the phrase community as method, they're not sure what it means. They've got their own interpretation of it, but they're not quite sure what that really means. But in reality, that phrase was coined. I happened to coin it, and there was a reason for doing it, because we were being funded by NIDA for research, and they were rightfully asking, what's the approach? What do they do there? Is this a faith-based program? Is this AA? What do you do in the therapeutic community? That's the, the, the method that you, what's the treatment method that you, you engaged in? They were right to ask that question because if we were taking money from the federal government in terms of providing treatment, we should be able to describe what's the treatment approach and what's the theory behind it and why are we doing what we do? And so I had to do, work on the whole issue of legitimately, how do you basically uh, communicate the, the real TC approach because everybody tries to, describe this elephant from a different perspective. And in reality, it, it, what it required was, well, wait a minute, there is a real approach here, but it's complicated. It's not, it's not easy to describe. It's not simply reading uh, something on uh, 
uh, relapse prevention or, or trauma-informed therapy, all of which may be relevant to substance abuse, but that is not necessarily the method. You can't even call it CBT, although it has overlaps with those kinds of methods. What is the actual method of the TC? A very challenging, challenging phrase. And so I want to go now to the next slide and begin this last part of my discussion with this idea of fidelity, because all of the issues I've been describing have affected the, ther the fidelity of the TC. And, uh, and until we wake up to that and say, we, we did develop a method, it's called community's method, uh, if we, and it has been shown to be effective, it's also uh, invited increasing attention to we need more and more research and clinical experience to make it better and better, rather than simply adapting it uh, in terms of uh, getting smaller and less effective, but, but only providing services and service delivery. How do you really advance this method, which was so dramatic in the early years, in producing uh, some of the accomplishments that we talked about? I titled this slide, Fidelity, which means faithful to, the word fidelity, faithful to. And you say, what? Oh, well, I'm gonna come back to it. It's faithful to the model, that is what goes into this program, and, and the practice. And we're gonna see, that's what we mean by fidelity. What's, what's in that program and how is it practiced and why is it practiced? So why I title this slide for Delhi, why we do what we do. And you can see everything we do in the therapeutic community, this is just a quick primer on community as method, but it begins with uh, fidelity. Everything that we do in the TC, if you wanna say what's our method, Every activity, every relationship, every group, every meeting, everything that we do in the TC has a purpose, which is therapeutic and or educational. So that means we're using an entire social and physical involvement, context, that people have to learn to use to change themselves. So, and we, we have a particular, uh, and that's grounded in our best understanding of what we know about the disorder, and what we know about the individual, uh, and what we know about recovery, and what we know about right living. That is, the early participants ultimately were mutually teaching themselves and using each other to learn something that it was, it was not simply your substance abuse that was the problem when you got here. It was also, you had a lot of other issues that had to change behaviors and attitudes and emotional management. It wasn't simply dropping your substance abuse and, and staying clean. You couldn't stay clean very long unless other changes occurred. So our first understanding, and this is one that began to develop our, our own theory on this, which was we had a view of the disorder, and it was a disorder of the whole person, and you've seen this in some of my videos, and you've, you've seen it in some of the writings. But that is the view of the, of the, of the TC's view of substance abuse that it's a, dis it's a disorder of the whole person. A lot of things, a lot has to change about that person. It's not simply that they have to stop using drugs. Ironically, when people come into the TC, they've stopped, they stop using drugs within 30 days. And, and that's only the beginning of the process. It's not the end of the process, right? We say, first you stop, then you'll change, you understand? And the issue is not that you have to change in order to stop, you understand? First you stop, then you'll change if you, if you continue. And then we had a view of the individual. We knew very well there were typical characteristics, behaviors, emotional characteristics, and attitudes that had to change. And we had a view of recovery, which meant that change really was, and, and the word, if we really mean the word change in an expanded way, was really recovery, and recovery was really changes not only in, uh, in relinquishing substance abuse, but also a lifestyle change, values and attitudes and so on. And then finally, we had a value system, which we called right living. And, and, and so when we talk about fidelity, why we do what we do, everything we do is governed by this perspective. Our view of recovery, our view of the individual, our view of right living, and our view of the disorder. So now I want to go to what actually then would be on the basis that we've just been talking about, what's the actual method? What, what, what is it? So here's one that's, what you're gonna hear now, you probably have not heard before. And uh, I wanna share it with you because it's simple, but it's deceptive because you have to think about it. 
when you want to say, what is a th what are, what's a therapeutic community approach? Because everybody thinks it's peers. Of course it's peers, but that's not the approach. That means you know, peers are simply a component of all this. So I'm going to give you a definition. It's the purpose of the intentional use of a community to teach individuals to use the community to change themselves. It's deceptive, so I'm going to come back to it. If we're a community in this room or in this conference, if we're using community as method, we mean we as a community will teach you how to use we, the community, everything, all relationships, all activities, groups, meetings, so on, to change yourself. You are learning to change yourself by using the community to do that. We have to do that as a community. We'll teach you that, and then if you do it, you, can, you will change. So you can see these four points really begin to spell out what we mean by the method, and you can look at your own program, your own history in programming, and you can and then look at a number of programs that are now operating today as TCs and see really, is this going on in the TC? Watch, the community is the general context. That is everything that you're gonna learn about yourself for a while, maybe a year, maybe two years, is gonna be learned through your essentially involvement in this community. That's what's, that's what the original TC, 24 hours, seven days a week, everything you are gonna learn about, about yourself is gonna be based upon all the roles that you play in, in that community. You play a whole variety of roles. We know hierarchical work roles and so, and so on, and, and participation in all kinds of activities. They are all there for you to see yourself. And that's what we mean by the context. You don't go outside for services on this. It all happens in here, in this community. But also the community sets the standards for this. How, what the expectation is about how you're supposed to participate. We're gonna tell you how you do that. You can't simply sit around in, in the back room or in the back chair, you know what I mean? It's gonna be ultimately being you engaged in a whole variety of activities and there are expectations about when you're participating in those activities. You will constantly be reminded of that, sometimes confronted of that, sometimes affirmed and reinforced for doing that, and sometimes uh, criticized for not doing that. So community is a method when it sets the expectations when it's constantly evaluating whether you're meeting those expectations, and then finally they'll give you the feedback, both criticism as well as affirmational feedback about how you are changing, with also recommending recommendations about how you, you can go forward in those changings. What I'm describing is simply the basic components of community as method. You can ask in the program, do I have a peer community that is really doing that? and namely every member of that community is learning to essentially uh, hear the expectations of the community, provide evaluations. We usually talk about verbal you know, uh, pull-ups and push-ups. That's all, that's all variations on providing, assessing and, and giving you feedback about how you are changing or not changing, how you are participating and not participating. So how do we understand about with, with communities method and how do people really change? Well, if the individual uses it, if they do it, if you actually essentially use the context and, and meet the expectations of the community in this, then you can then look at yourself, have the community look at you, you look at you, community looks at you, and in terms of me, has meeting the expectations resulted in you changing. And this is the key, it's very straightforward, that's how they got through the first 30 years when we essentially attempted to meet those expectations, uh, and, the, the, and, and we did meet those, those expectations, the individual essentially showed that their behaviors were changing, their attitudes were changing. We used to talk about people getting more mature, people getting essentially more sensible in this respect, so that in meeting community expectations for participation, uh, you, you are actually changing when you're doing that. That's why we use phrases like buying in. You know, individuals who are in a program that's called community as method have to get to a level where they begin to accept, I, yes, I'm gonna to try to meet those expectations. And even when I don't, maybe even when I kind of miss it, or uh, what I call avoid it, 
it's not a failure because as long as you're trying, that's the important thing. We expect people to simply uh, make trial. If we see this trial and error. You're gonna, you, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll make some errors. The issue is not making the errors. Is the issue is not trying. If you now come back and saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it again, and what did I learn from what I did and didn't do? That's why we do, a lot of people call this, unfortunately, in negative language, this confrontation, but it's, it's simply meeting, two people meeting reality together and saying, what did you do and what didn't you do? As long as you are learning from the, from the, the errors that you're making, you're changing. So, community's method relates to ultimately long-term change because individuals strive to meet community uh, uh, expectations. And they, as a result, they start changing behaviors and attitudes in themselves that they've had lifetime, uh, in their lifetime. So the process, this whole process can be summarized. If you participate, then you will change. It's very simple. Uh, the reason why I try to emphasize the simplicity of it, your residents have to hear that. That is, they have to hear it's, it is all about participation. And if you'll do it, something will happen to you. And therefore, if it's a community as a method, the community is also trained itself, sophisticated itself, to be essentially set standards, uh, evaluate them, and give you the feedback. And in all of that, the staff, so, so to speak, is, what's the real role of staff in, in, in a program that's called community as method? Well, staff are only facilitators of community as method. They're not staff in the old sense of mental health or medical staff who are knowledgeable people, who know more, and who are essentially gonna provide this treatment. That is not what the TC is. Staff in the TC are simply, they understand facility, uh, they understand community as method, and they gotta help train the community in facility as method. Now, if you've been following this, this discussion, you can always think back about the programs you have been in, if you're very recovering through them, Think back if you're a staff or participant in other ways, are we really practicing community as method? Because it was that method, and it is that method, which essentially is the fundamental one that transforms people. It's not reading brochures and it's not reading uh, protocols. It's essentially the everyday interaction with the community and all the roles that you play in that community and community is constantly evaluating whether you're doing it and you're constantly reacting to it in positive and negative ways, and it's that process that has to go on. So, as we come to an end on this, let me just say this. It's a, that's a brief primer on community as method in the TC, but it was all around the idea of fidelity. That's how I started this, and I said that my greatest concern, and also my only source of optimism, is the recognition that there's been a profound approach that has been developed in the therapeutic community, which we've termed communities method. That's the reason I've spent a little time on reminding you of what I meant by communities, communities method. Because the future of the TC as an approach is gonna depend upon whether everybody who's participating in the T calls themselves therapeutic community are really engaged in community as method. And I doubt that that's the case. We know, we know, hope, hopefully there are programs around the world, of course, that are closer to it than others, but there aren't enough. So in talking about going forward, what do we do? Are we trying to preserve a method, a profound method called community's method, which can continually be refined? Uh, or are we simply continuing or trying to preserve an organization? And namely a, a service delivery organization, which is fine if you want to do that. That's, there's, there's benefits to, to the society in you providing service delivery and relief for individuals. That can go on. I'm not against that. But that is not the future of the therapeutic community. The future of the therapeutic community as a profound approach to human change is the one that I'm essentially captivated by. So these are the four, and it all depends really on, this begins with we all understand what we mean, and that's why I've, I've, I've kind of centered on fidelity. So the future of the TC depends upon how well it really understands and practices a community as method in terms of what we call high fidelity. And I've got on this slide examples of standard TCs. They, there are very few of those. Modified TCs and those that simply borrow some elements from the TC that I call TC-oriented. 
those are, that, that simply describes a kind of the landscape of programs that, that tell, call themselves therapeutic communities, but they're not really practicing community as method, with the exception of a few that look like they're more standard in the original approach, but there are very few of those. So this, the, in order to make sure that we can survive and thrive in the future in terms of this approach, <laughs> I believe that the, uh, the, the real training has to essentially emanate in centers of excellence. And some of you who know me know that I've tried to teach and preach this important step. How do we develop uh, regional, local centers of excellence? High fidelity TC programs that understand community as method, practice it, and then tr can train it to any staff person and anybody who's going to be a participant in that. Uh, you know, and I borrowed this really from classical uh, medicine in graduate schools. You know, in other words, the best schools were those essentially that understood the methods, were serving the patients. You went to the best school in order to get the best training. And so what I'm saying is the future of the TC, the future of community as method needs centers of excellence. There's another one here that I never talked about in, in this talk. I'm only gonna mention it because it's very important as kind of an adults working in the field to recognize the following, that even though we can reach high fidelity, even though we can have wonderful programs, even if you believe everything I'm saying now, we know that individuals who even graduate TCs or drop out of TCs or move in the recovery process, when they move out into the world, uh, they are threatened. They're at risk in the world. The world itself carries risks for the individual in terms of recovery and continuing in their recovery process. Fortunately, we have some, some numbers of people who, who survive it all, and we think we understand why they were survive it. But this point, which is called recovery-oriented integrated systems, is only to say that the world outside of the TC is also problematic. And that even if we focus in on what we call our own aftercare system, uh, which, which is uh, essentially implemented now for a lot of service delivery. We know that there are virtually no recoveries if individuals don't continue in the recovery process in some ways. So the future of the TC, as good as it has been, is going to still require that we have, we're changing the system outside in small ways, namely even just the aftercare system. Set up a recovery system which is all re essentially integrated by the concept of recovery, stages of recovery, and so that we know when individuals leave TCs, they're moving to the next stage of their recovery, and they've got in the system that they've got the appropriate place to go to do that. And we can talk about models of recovery-oriented uh, integrated systems. And then lastly, why, of course, now if you've heard my bias on all this, why we absolutely have to come back to advancing research in, in and programs that call themselves therapeutic communities so that we can address those issues of accountability and, and improving treatment. So with all of this, uh, I have a comment. You see this on this slide, it's my last slide. I've always seen the TC as an experiment in progress. It's now 50, 60 years later, folks. I still see it as an experiment in progress, but it's, it's more threatened because it has gone through this evolution I've described. And if we don't pay attention to the concern, which is, can we really uh, 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 implement high fidelity community as method programs as we understand it, or let's say, pay attention to the previous slide and begin to really uh, in, uh, introduce those particular uh, options, uh, the TC is an experiment. That is, uh, it's in progress. It'll either uh, it'll continue uh, in in some of the current course, which is organizations which are ser service delivery organizations saying that they are therapeutic communities, but they're not advancing community as method, but they're doing something else. They're providing services of some sort, uh, or at least among all of that, at least several kinds of programs which declare themselves as community as method programs which are really designed to produce long-term recovery changes in the individual in the ways that we've been describing it, uh, by, by particularly uh, holding on to the fidelity of it. So the uh, contemporary TC, today's TC, 
They can, we can transcend the fate of historical prototype. What I mean by that, if you go back 2,000 years, there's always been communities for people who are marginalized, but those communities disappeared. They got co-opted. And it looks like uh, the therapeutic community for a substance abuse disorder, which launched around 1959 in the United States, is also disappearing. And, uh, but we've got pockets of maybe uh, of good survival, and, and we, we may see that. I'm hoping this kind of a talk would kind of reignite your imagination and your, and your interest in doing this. So the, the, today's TC is a kind of hybrid. It's a community spawned from both the union of self-help and public support. I wanted to make sure that uh, it doesn't, as a result of that union, it doesn't lose its unique and powerful distinction, which is how do we uh, use a community intentionally to help individuals change their lives, use a community intentionally to help individuals change their lives. My final comment on this is when I understand it, it's not very original. Very, very good families do that. That is a good family, you know, how do, if it's a good family, you, 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 you learn from the roles that you play in your family, the role models that you have in the family, and the teachings of the family, uh, and you learn about yourself and how to be. So we're not very far off what I think nature intended. Thank you very much for indulging me on this.